welcome to The Last Stitch. We have had a chance to examine quilts in many different stages, from the templates to the blocks to the finished quilt, but we haven't gotten to see one thing, and that's the quilts on the beds. A lot of people have written and wondered, where do I work and where do I live? So we thought it would be a nice chance and an opportunity for you to take a trip through my home and see some quilts in action. Come on in. We are here in the family room where our family, of course, keeps warm in the wintertime and just relaxes and watches television. And I've brought a few things in for you to examine from other parts of the house to kind of study. I'm reminded of a time Paul was having a talk with a reporter and she commented, I bet you have a quilt on every bed in the house. And he said, yes, and on the ceiling, in the kitchen, on the floor, and on all the chairs. So we will have a chance to really examine the many different ways to use quilts in home decorating, and I hope you can gather some ideas from this. One time I arrived at a craft fair with a dozen tennis racket covers, all made with a Dresden plate design, and the lady behind the booth was so excited, she said, at long last, someone has finally made some commode seat covers. So evidently, there is a market for commode seat covers. You might consider making some. I'm going to point out some of the blocks that we've been studying as we go along. And of course, this pillow is our star flower design. And its companion pillow is the King's X. And both of these I've highlighted with a deep eyelet ruffle. And I think that really does set off the whole block. Consider also that your small quilts, your afghan size quilts, work so nice in family rooms just to keep warm and cover up the legs when you're sitting. This old quilt hanging beside, behind me is actually pieced by my great-grandmother. And I'm very sentimental about this. This was the first quilt that I ever quilted on a frame. And I, it's fun to examine these things and note that even when she placed the hexagon template on this fabric, she centered the flower in each one of these little pieces. Remember when you're hanging your quilts that it's nice to also turn it around, maybe halfway during the year. Consider all these little fibers and these stitches are hanging down at one time. If you would take the Velcro and stitch it on the opposite side of your quilt, you can reverse this maybe every six months or so. And of course, this side of the Vel Velcro was then stapled to a piece of wood which was attached to the ceiling, um, and that was how this quilt was hung. Let's look around the room and gather some other ideas the cats and um, patchwork turned into animals has become very popular. And this is some old hexagon work that I did, and I've turned those into patchwork cats. Over the windows, you will notice some work of one of my friends, Frances Gardena. She let me borrow this so we could really have a good chance to look at what we call a cloth frieze done with many variations of House Over the Hill. Over in the corner, we have a touch of Christmas. Grace Anderson has quilted a Christmas tree and placed it in a frame, an old round frame, which is a good idea for changing and converting your themes throughout the year. The Ohio Star has been done by Susan Osterjung. Quite often we have a dark alcove where it would be very dark in the background, and I think a quilt hung in that area really does brighten up a dark paneled wall. I'd like to take you into my country bedroom now. A guest bedroom has always been a special place to show off all the quilts that you've made. You recognize the attic windows quilt. Quite often, a quilter would more or less store all of her quilts on the bed, and this would be a good place to do that. She could simply layer all the different quilts that she'd finished and, and was so proud of, and of course, when the guest would come, she would go through each one and explain the pattern and the stitches that she used and all the different designs. And of course, then she could take her pick of the one she wanted to sleep under. On the back wall of this room, I have a very graphic example of a, a quilt that I have sometimes heard called either the schoolhouse or the big house. But it's a good idea to remember that when we put a block such as the house on the hill or moon over the mountain in a quilt, we all of a sudden create a top and a bottom to our quilt. But look what this quilter has done. She has taken all the chimneys and they more or less run into each other. So this quilt could be turned any which way and it would, it would work on a bed. 
I'd like to also take a look at two very small quilts on the wall over here that are used as decoration. These are from the Charleston area and were actually doll crib quilts. Perhaps the quilter had some blocks left over from her large quilt and then satisfied her daughter by making a small little quilt for her dolls. To complete this room, I used the attic windows pattern again and made a cloth valance, a quilted valance, more or less to not only decorate the top of the window but to warm the window also. I went ahead and put the batting inside and quilted this and then a shade, a pull shade, can be hidden underneath. Let's wind our way upstairs to the top of the house. On the way upstairs, let's take a break and look at a stairwell that is really pretty dark with all the paneling, but it can be made more interesting too. The hall tree has been decorated with a seat cover and crazy patch, and what I did here was really just make myself a cloth pattern in muslin to fit the seat and then covered it with crazy patch and put the velvet as a backing with, of course, the embroidery stitches. We can also top off the hanger up part of the hall tree with not only hats, but how about a, a denim backpack? This has held many a sandwich for a hike. The patchwork hat is kind of fun also. This was made with some of the, with some of the tie silks. I think also to decorate the wall and really brighten up the dark paneling would be the patchwork pictures. To mount this on the back, I simply made a muslin casing that was slip stitched on the top side and then a piece of wooden lattice would slide through here and I used these picture framers that would simply attach to the lattice and then just two little tacks to attach them to the wall. I'm in the living room with many more projects, some of them yet to be finished. For instance, the large quilt top that's on the oval hoop. Many more stitches to go in this one. I've also done a little fun thing here by taking some of the chintz, the orange chintz, and smocking it for a lampshade. We can also take our blocks and adapt them for wall hangings so nicely. In this case, I've used the row houses block to block and added a little accent of applique, not only in the smoke coming out of the chimney, but in the pass coming down from the door of the houses. I think that's, that can be a nice touch. I'd use more of that orange chintz to cover a, a wicker rocker and then even put some pockets on the outside to hold magazines and newspapers. We always think of patchwork as being pieced, but we can use just solid material and go ahead and put our stencil design on that, and that becomes a nice pillow backing for the rocking chair. The large motif on the couch, every time I see that, I kind of remember when I went to buy this, I had told my friend Will as we were driving to the fabric shop that I wanted a light geometric for my living room. And look what I came back with, a dark floral print. So sometimes we change our minds in midstream. But I've used this color motif, the salmon and the black and white, to continue in everything that more or less that I've decorated this room. You remember our sawtooth star block, the six inch center, I simply cut out of muslin and then based the crazy patch on that, not only for the backing of the chair, but for the seat also. In the dining room, I've carried out the black and white motif in the shoe fly placemats and also the wall hangings against the wall, which I think you remember from our earlier shows. I promised you more quilts on beds. Let's look at more quilts. A teenager's room is mostly centered around, well, loud music and blue jeans, but I think Paul has really enjoyed the patchwork duvets that we showed earlier. The extra trim that I put on the curtains is merely more of the plaid material turned on the bias. It's such a treat to see Amy's bed made. This is a blue sampler with a darker print as the border and it was more or less designed to go with the blue rug in her room. To complete the walls in this room, I simply added one of the patchwork pictures design with a checkerboard border all the way around. And would you believe a string quilt top for a shower curtain? This works very well, an old hand-me-down string quilt used in the bathroom. My black and white quilt is completed. What a king-size job for a king-size quilt. 
But remember, this was based on four of our 12 inch blocks put together. So we are really lap quilting a 24 and a half inch square. But really, to even further complete this story, I finished the big pillow, floor pillow, which is our moon over the mountain blocks, with a double bias edging all the way around in a ruffle. And then I think it's nice to go ahead and put a zipper on the back of a pillow this size. I think it really completes it. To further this whole scheme of black and white, I have put black and white striped cloth on the wall, so we could call this wall cloth. Your secret here is to have your fabric already ironed and a staple gun and two good friends. Shirley and Frances hung this marvelous fabric on the, on the wall by simply using the staple and flip method. Rather than sew and flip, they would staple it and then flip it back. A teaching tool that I have enjoyed using is the banner in the corner of the log cabin variations. Remember, we've got the capital steps, the barn raising, the sunshine and shadows, and then your traditional log cabin with your print versus your solid or your light versus your dark. In the corner you see my lovely swans. Those were painted on your actual muslin by Joan Sibley. I think she did a very nice job to more or less tie in my black and white theme. Also on the rocker we have a Dresden plate pillow and I learned an interesting trick with Dresden plate this week when I was in Tallahassee. If you cut out your Dresden plate template and instead of using this as a curved or a pointed section go ahead and just cut it straight across and then by putting the two right sides together and machine stitching across that end you're simply able to then turn that inside out and invert it and you get a nice V and of course in this case you do that 16 times and then sew your little templates together, your piecework together and you would make your ring. I'd like to show you the stenciled screen now. The stenciled screen has served as a good teaching tool. It's really nice for all of my students to be able to examine all the different lines that are created in the many traditional patterns. At the same time, I've enjoyed using this at the window because it eliminates using a lot of curtains. In the wings, we have a log cabin quilt waiting to go on in another season when it rolls around. As far as the kitchen goes, I find this a very practical place and a good opportunity to use pre-quilted fabric. In this case, I've simply made a cover to go over the toaster out of pre-quilted fabric. The same thing would go for our little bun warmer, and the only accent here would be the eyelet and the ribbon around the sides. But for a more personal touch, I think it's nice to go ahead and make a set of placemats. You remember our coffee cup pattern with our side borders to match our entire set of china. And then once again, the apron is a good idea, our moon over the mountain pattern with the eyelet for the apron. I've enjoyed hanging my white on white quilt. This has always been one of my favorites. It's a sampler with the eyelet around the border and also as a trim around the outside edge. And I didn't want to put nails in the wall here and I found one of the solutions at the lumber yard by simply purchasing the lumber molding that would be for picture hanging, and this works very nice to hang the quilt. I want to take you now to where I spend most of my time every day, the lap quilting studio. The circular stairs have proved to be a great space saver down below in the studio, and I've also found that at least three ladies can sit on the stairs if I'm conducting a class. We tend to get so close to our patchwork. I think if we are at a distance, we get more perspective when we're deciding on our colors and our pattern design. So quite often, I will put my colors out and then come up on the stairs and have a better perspective of my decision making. When it comes to storing my fabric, I like to separate them into colors in these big bins that I have at the other end of the studio. One of my solutions for sorting out my fabric has been to keep them in big bins. 
I think this really helps. It's not the neatest thing in the world, but at least I know if they're color-coded, it gives me an opportunity to know if I need a yellow, I can just reach and pull out that whole bin and then sit down on the floor with my templates and decide what goes where. I've really found that to be the solution. I think someone who teaches quilting or makes quilts or just enjoys bed covers will find that sooner or later you're going to have a collection started. And it's important to know how to store these quilts, how to clean them, and how to handle them. This is a good example of a very old quilt. This is a crazy patch quilt done during the Civil War in South Carolina. For a teacher, this gives us a good way to study all the different embroidery stitches. And notice in this one how much nature is brought into our, our embroidery work and our handwork. We've got a butterfly, birds, and flowers. Quite often on old crazy patch quilts that come from New England, I find a lot of spider webs in each one of the blocks. And someone has told me that that pertains to their folklore. So I find that very interesting. Notice that I've got this one stored on a big round tube. Now one of the problems in storing old quilts is that you'll find that on the back side, and if you look at this one, I think you get more or less the idea. You'll see where it's been folded over a period of years. And this is one of the problems. You don't want to keep your quilts folded at the same point all the time. One of the things to do then is to go to like your, your rug store and get these cardboard tubes. And if you cover these with muslin, and then I simply slip stitch these all the way down, I find that then I can roll my quilts on these and they'll only be one crease. And then say every six months you can turn them and it won't have the same crease each time. I think also, keep in mind, you're probably in the habit of taking something old like this and put it in a cedar closet. That's the worst thing you can do. Try and keep your quilts away from wood or anything that would have a high pH factor such as that. Um, paper sacks, that would be another bad thing. Do not store them in plastic. They need to breathe. But I found that if you will roll it up on something like this and then keep it up on a shelf where it will be against muslin, say a nice clean muslin pillowcase would be another good way to store your, your quilts. When it comes to that decision as to whether or not you will wash your quilt or not, I think you really need to go to someone who has really been trained in cloth preservation. Perhaps your local museum has someone who knows a lot about fiber care and that would be a good thing to do. This is an old quilt from the Charleston area and it's the marvelous English chintz. I think they were so smart years ago, there was a high premium put on this English chintz. And in order to make it go further in this country, the, the ladies would cut it up and then go ahead and applique this design on a whole cloth piece. And uh, if I study, you study the names underneath these, these have actually been signed 1845. So I know this is very old. But this is a good way to store your quilts. The other one in this collection has not only the English chintz, but you can see the Irish chain piecework. That's unusual to see the piecework combined with the chintz as a border. From here, we need to spend some time at the sewing machine. I've really enjoyed having my sewing machine right at the window. It's very peaceful to be sewing and then every once in a while to stop and be able to look outside. There are a couple of techniques that we need to clarify, I think, before the show closes. And one of them has to do with the pockets that go in the tote bags. I know I use the expression French seam, and I'm not sure everyone really understands what that means. To start with a tote bag pocket, you need a rectangle that's about 9 inches by 20. And of course, this can vary depending on how large you want your pocket. But you want to take that and sew the short end and take a full 5 8 seam sewing all the way across because you're then going to go ahead and take your zipper and of course with the teeth facing the outside, I like to open that and then use this as a guide to place right along that seam. Machine stitch that side to your pocket and be careful you don't catch that underneath when you're doing that. Then go ahead and close your zipper and with that down you'll finish sewing that all the way across. Turn that inside out and then you have your zipper already in your pocket. Now you can decide how far down you want your pocket, the zipper to come, whether you want it like that or you might want it a little bit higher against the top of your tote bag. 
But once that has been done, then you can simply machine stitch one side. And of course, with a French seam, you're always working on the outside first. In other words, the inside is towards each other. So go ahead and machine stitch this. And I, I like to use a narrow, a narrow stitch here and create really just a quarter inch seam allowance all the way around each side. And you can back stitch when you get to the end if you want to. And then quite often, I will even take this and trim this down to a very narrow, even an eighth of an inch seam. Because what's going to happen here is you're going to invert this and sew it again. So actually, with a French seam, you're creating an enclosed seam. Now I turn this and make sure you get that all the way, push that all the way out. And then you have to kind of, with this creased, very, very good, you have to kind of get rid of your threads and then crease that all the way down and put your pins here. Then you're going to come and stitch that again. And so you're going to have an enclosed seam. And line up, make sure you're actually your right sides are facing each other now all the way down and when you get to the end back stitch that really does lock that in place so that gives you nice free seams inside without any raw edges and you can really have a nice pocket there and both sides have a French seam now another technique that I think is very important and I find is a real problem in finishing our quilts, and we're faced with this double bias fold quite often, not only in quilts, but on the outside of our jackets, our vest, and even in our photograph album. Remember, when we have a bias fold, they've got to meet, and you're always in a dilemma. How is that going to happen correctly? I know you're tempted to just take and turn that in and let that just rest against that and have that kind of a seam. But, and, you, and you might be tempted to do that, but you look over your shoulder and make sure no one sees because you know that's not the correct way. What has to happen, because this is a bias fold, you're going to have your diagonal connection. And I've got a little system that I think might help us to better understand that. When you have your double bias, bias fold, let that rest against the fabric. And then, now I've used a different color so you'd understand a little bit better here. Let this fall against this also. Then take the ones, the side that's closest to the quilt, and simply put a pin there. Do you see where they're just meeting? Put a pin there, and then come down here in the same top fold. Let the pins meet. Then from here, take your little pin or your soap, whatever you use to mark, and measure out a half an inch from each pin. Come here and put a half an inch, and come down to this pin and put a half an inch. It's from there that then you're going to cut a nice diagonal all the way down. You've got your half inch started here and cut this diagonal all the way and the half an inch will then give you the proper amount. You see how that's going to line up with that and you'll go ahead and put these together like this. I'm not going to sew these but I'll pin them and I think you'll get a good idea once that's been pinned and this comes all the way back like so then you'll see that that's going to meet correctly. Do you see how that's going to have a nice fold all the way across and that will be meeting correctly? So that would be the way to go ahead and finish it off properly without having that crossover that wouldn't be proper. I need to take a few minutes and go to the rocking chair to give some very special thank yous. I'd like to pick up my quilting first and we realize that this is towards the end here of our show and I have the first special thank you to, t to make to all the wonderful quilters who have shared their fiber art with us. I know that they have put a lot of time and effort in them. I have enjoyed working with many of my students and it's been very meaningful to me to have all their handicraft right on the set with me. And another thank you to the many viewers who have responded to our series. We really appreciate this and a special thank you to my mother who has helped me put these in different categories of states. I understand that you really do appreciate the shows and that makes us feel good. The uh, lady from Ohio who wrote that she was going to quilt her family's mouth shut if they weren't quiet when our show was on was a favorite of mine. And then for instance a lady who writes that she's teaching a 4-H club of high school girls. 
So, uh, and then the next letter would be a lady who has 12 grandchildren and she wants to make each one of them a quilt. And then the lady who wrote from Burlington, North Carolina, who said she even enjoys the repeats because she learns a lot more. I realize I do go fast on a series, but we can quite often depend on repeats and that works out very nicely. But thank you very much for that. We appreciate it. And then the camera crew. If you see my eyes wandering once in a while to somewhere else on the set, it's because I'm trying to teach the people on the big cameras how to quilt also. There have been times when my mouth didn't quite work right and the producer and the director have been very sensitive to this. They want you to learn so they would stop and we would do things over again. And that makes me feel good because they have your lessons at heart and that works out very nicely. Then a special thank you to my friends and to my family. I promise my family I will cook again. I will return to the kitchen. But at the same time, I know they understand that the time I spend with quilting works for them also because it makes me happy and maybe that's selfish but we do enjoy it and I think the whole family has felt very fulfilled from this also. James Taylor has a special song out and of course he is an artist with music rather than fiber. Well maybe he quilts, I'm not quite sure. But he does do wonderful things with music and the title of the song is The Secret to Life is Enjoying the Passing of Time. I enjoy a lot of my time quilting and I hope that you will find the time that you spend quilting and learning how to working, working with fiber will be very meaningful for you and that this is something that you can cherish and pass on down to your children just as it is carried on through my family. Thank you so much for watching and we hope to see you again sometime. Goodbye. Georgia Bone Steel is the author of the book, Lap Quilting with Georgia Bone Steel, based on this television series. Thank you.